So our first two speakers are Wayne Jackman of Noble Exploration Services and Dave Sacker of Farmer and Environmental Consulting. And they're going to be talking about the Trek Surface Geochemical Expo Sediment Exploration Program, generating and evaluating a high quality geochemical data set. Thanks, Ray. Um, I'm actually uh, the warm up act. Uh, Dave is uh, going to spend quite a bit more time talking about some of the uh, high level data interpretation that we've done with the, the data sets. Uh, I'm going to just basically talk about uh, some of the components that, uh, uh, of the uh, Trek geochemical project that uh, was conducted over about a three year period. Um, the first thing I wanted to do is just a, a show of hands of, of how many people have actually followed up a till geochemistry anomaly. Are there many people in the crowd that have actually done that? Okay, a handful. Anybody thought about following up till geochemistry anomalies and basically decided that perhaps it was a little complicated? Well, hopefully, hopefully by the end of this session, you'll have a much more confident, much more confident with, with till, uh, till geochemistry. And for those that have actually already done some follow-up, uh, you'll be interested to know that Dave will have a list of uh, unstaked anomalies that uh, he's highlighted in his actual uh, work. So, so I'll, I'll bumble my way through that my 10-minute talk and uh, uh, generally look forward to uh, what Dave has to say. Uh, so initially, uh, quickly, um, this slide just basically touches on some of the uh, objectives we had. We wanted to collect new geochemical and mineralogical data. Uh, we wanted to uh, take a look at some of the existing data sets that uh, have been uh, created since about the 1990s. And of course, at the very end, we wanted to uh, deliver a, a nice high quality uh, exploration data set that uh, Dave will definitely uh, explore in the latter half of the, uh, the talk. Uh, so past and present. There's, uh, a number of uh, different multi-element uh, programs that have been conducted. Uh, we've had biogeochemical bio work that uh, uh, Colin Dunn uh, was involved in in the 1990s in the northern sections of the uh, uh, Trek study area. We, uh, we did a, a program in 2015 uh, uh, looking at uh, sampling treetops tree uh, in an area just uh, south of Blackwater Davidson, north of the Agachus. Uh, there was uh, a number of lake and stream programs that have been conducted over time, including uh, RGS uh, surveys in the 80s. Um, Steve Cook, uh, when he was with the BCGS, did some lake programs in the 90s. And Geoscience BC funded programs in 05, 06, and 07. And uh, uh, we did a uh, 2013, we also did an additional uh, work uh, to add to the, that database. And of course, till. And till is generally what my talk is going to concentrate on, the till surveying that we did. I'm going to touch on, a, on the 2015 uh, treetop and the 2013 lake survey. Um, but I'm going to spend most of my time discussing the, uh, the till work. Um, and of course, those were uh, uh, related to some of the previous BCGS work that was done in the, from 1990 to 2008, uh, uh, some GSC survey work and the 2013 and 2014 programs that we conducted. Uh, so just quickly, uh, this, this particular survey, um, Colin Dunn was very instrumental in the, in the planning and development of this program. Uh, him and Dave are going to be talking about that in a little bit more detail at a later talk. So I'm basically just going to say we did it. It was a, one of the largest surveys of its type uh, that's been done in North America, I guess, I'm not too sure in the world. Uh, we did almost 400 sites on a one kilometer space staggered grid. And it was an area that was pretty much completely inaccessible by, by any other, other means. And so we felt it was a great opportunity not only to test a, a, a method, um, but also to get into this area and, and at least start developing uh, a, a, a much more uh, detailed uh, coverage of uh, geochemistry. Uh, we also, um, in 2013, on the, uh, which would be on the east side of the project area, the yellow dots represent uh, 264 sample sites that uh, uh, we, uh, we sampled uh, center lake sediments and surface waters from. Uh, this area uh, expanded the coverage uh, 
uh, of previous uh, geoscience BC projects as well as the earlier BCGS work. Um, in the end, uh, I think we have a collection of over 1,600 samples, uh, which basically is, uh, uh, covers uh, pretty much the entire uh, study area. Um, um, this was also, a lot of this work was also included in some of Dave's work that he's uh, going to talk about in the second half of the talk. Uh, so again, I just want to really quickly go through some of the uh, 2013 and 2014 Trek field programs related to the till, till sampling. Um, we sampled a, a number of different areas. Of course, uh, it's a very large area, so there were, there were areas which were um, definitely unsurveyed, which hadn't actually been looked at, so we definitely covered those in detail. And we also did some infill sampling to improve some density, uh, site density, and, and of course provide data continuity in areas that were previously surveyed by both the BCGS and the Geological Survey of Canada. Um, so basal till, very important slide because we, we, need, to, we need to do establish a target uh, sample medium and, and basal till became the obvious solution um, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, um, generally, uh, we wanted to uh, uh, have some continuity with, the, with obviously the previous till work and we needed something that was relatively common uh, within the survey area. So we looked at basal till which is uh, uh, generally described as being eroded, transported and deposited under the ice. So it, it has certain unique properties. Uh, in, in the Trek area we observed that it was generally massive, dense, dark brown, matrix supported diamectin. Uh, it oft, often uh, exhibited facility and jointing, and it had a sandy silt matrix. Um, so the advantages of using this till, apart from the two I already mentioned, it, it is a first derivative of bedrock, so it has a very similar geochemical signature. There is a very well-known transport history due to the ice flow studies that have been done in the area, and it really does produce a nice anomaly, anomaly signature at surface, which is really um, inviting for uh, exploration work. Oops. Um, the challenge that we had is that there are several different types of, of till facies, and, of, and it can be very um, difficult to differentiate these different types. So uh, one of the more other common types of till is an ablation till. Um, it's it's, it's uh, um, basal till's evil brother, and it's described as a sandy loose diamectin deposited by melt-out process in association with stagnant ice and consists of far travel glacial material. Very important statement because it, it, it really is not favorable as a sample material due to the fact that it has a complicated transport history. It's virtually impossible, even if you have an anomaly, it's virtually impossible to determine the origin of that, the source of that anomaly. Uh, the, other, the other type of diamectin we encountered was glacial lacustrine deposits. And again, they lack density and have a, a matrix comprised of, of purely of silt. And again, uh, their uh, transport history is just way too complicated to, to really be much use in terms of a sample media. So saying that, it, it is vital that you actually are able to target the basal till and, and know what it looks like when you encounter it in the field and, and take appropriate samples. Um, so before, so we established that basal till was really what our target media was. The next challenges that we've had, I've done quite a few, oh, a few large scale surveys in my time. And, and this probably ranks up there as one of the more challenging. And it had a lot to do with the size. The fact that it was 28, one to 50,000 NTS map sheets was a little bit uh, um, daunting. daunting. Yes, thank you, Dave. Uh, considering when a lot of these surveys were done previously, they would concentrate on one or two, one to 50,000 sheets. Well, we said we would do 28. Um, of course, it is a time-consuming process to locate potential sample sites, and, it, and it's difficult to actually identify the basal till. It's challenging, not, not totally uh, out of the question, but you definitely have to have some understanding of what you're searching for. And, and the third problem that we really had is there was a limited amount of uh, background geolog official geological information that was available for the area. So what we needed was some kind of uh, process or some method that could break through some of these difficulties and, and make, make the uh, challenge of do it, completing these, these surveys in a, in a timely manner and, and within the budget that we had allotted to us. And fortunately, there was some computer technology that really 
saved the day, and it allowed uh, the development of these uh, basal till potential maps using 3D technology. So you could actually look at, uh, opposed to the old stereotype air photos, you could actually look at these in three dimensional on screen and actually do your mapping and editing uh, directly into a uh, GIS uh, program. And so when you're doing this, you're looking at things like streamlined basal till and Humlicky ablation till, you could actually map these out with polygons that'll actually define these quite accurately and quickly. Um, um, so here's an example of one of the basal till potential maps. Um, it really does uh, indicate where to actually look for basal till. Um, and it's, an, it really is a powerful tool for accurately and efficiently producing maps that were then used to guide our field crews. And of course, they, they obviously have a, a usefulness for any follow-up activities that people may uh, maybe try. So within the survey itself, we had a two kilometer staggered grid aligned with ice flow is, is the common approach. Um, I didn't do anything. Uh, poor, is there a technical person? I didn't do it. I didn't touch anything. I just, I clicked the little arrow, right arrow. Uh oh. Is there anybody taking care of this? Yeah. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> so anyways, I have a beautiful picture here showing the site distribution. And then right beside it is a beautiful road cut sample site. You can just imagine it. It's So as I was saying, uh, you know, we use standard methods, staggered grid, lined with ice flow, very important. Um, we, we concentrate on collecting, of course, in situ basal till, as I uh, mentioned previously, the importance of, of, of identifying your, your target media and ensuring that it's been unaltered by any sort of processes, soil, form, so, uh, soil forming process or biological activity. You want to avoid roots and you want to make sure that there's no discoloration within the, within the material. Road cuts were generally uh, advantageous because they had already been slightly excavated. But uh, quite often, we would have to do further excavations within those sites up to greater than a, than a uh, meter uh, to expose the target material. And, and, the, and the big message here is that not all of these sites that we visited, even though we had all the tools in the world to actually get to these sites, we had crews that were knowledgeable, you would start digging and digging and digging. You may not get an actual basal till sample. Many sites we turned away from and started looking in other areas. Um, so we did collect over 1,200 sites in the end, but we probably visited at least twice as many and actually excavated twice as many sites without having any luck actually finding the material. We were that strict. We didn't, we didn't just sample for the sake of sampling. Okay, so that was that slide. I'm gonna to go to the next slide here. I'm almost done, I'm almost done here. You're doing a marvelous job describing it. Thank you. And then, so the types of tills, these are actually all pretty common slides anyway. So the types of samples that we collected, we did a two to, two to three kilogram sample, which is basically a uh, Hubco bag about this big, that uh, for trace, for matrix uh, uh, major, minor, and trace element geochemical analysis. Uh, we also collected, uh, well, Dave's changed my slide because we didn't actually select a second sample for archive. I think we split the first sample to create an archive split of our sample. We also collected 50 pebbles, uh, large, to, large pebbles to small cobbles for lithological studies. And at every other site throughout the survey area, we did 12 to 10 to 12 kilogram bulk samples for mineralogy. And we also did every infill site, because a lot of the sampling that was done in the 1990s did not include mineralogy, so it allowed us to provide uh, this type of coverage throughout the entire survey area. All right, my next slide, oh, this is, a this is one of the nicest slides. It has such a beautiful picture of basal till, like it's just, it's mouthwatering. <laughs> anyway, so these samples, 
as beautiful they are, we, we had them uh, processed uh, at the lab and uh, they were dried and sieved to produce a silt plus clay size fraction. And uh, that actual uh, matrix material was uh, analyzed for minor and trace elements by ICPMS um, and also major and minor elements by ACPES and uh, 34 elements by INAA. So a fairly substantial geochemical data set. Oh, perfect. Okay, was it back on one? Was it, any, was it my fault? No, that's Can not my change, fault. Uh, that's my picture, though. I took that picture. That looks familiar. Yeah. That's, uh, that's north of uh, Dave, and uh, Colin will talk about that. But that's, uh, that's our treetop sampling project. I just want this slide up there just because it's such a beautiful fissile subglacial till. Yes. Not easy to get, but sure satisfying when you finally walk away. Okay, so those are the, uh, the actual geochemical information that we correct. The bulk, the bulk till samples, um, 10 to 12 kilograms, sampled in one of those clear bags. Uh, so we, we produced mineral concentrates and, uh, and gold grain concentrates. And uh, the gold grain, sulfides, and porphyry copper indicator minerals were visually identified and picked from concentrates. Uh, the previous work was done by uh, Bureau Veritas, so I still always want to call them ACME, and Becquerel, and this was done by uh, Overburden Drilling in Ottawa. How am I doing for time? Uh, we'll probably close pretty soon. Okay, give me two minutes. Okay, this is also another important, important slide, which D Dave will expand on a little bit later, but... Uh, um, we also recognize that some of the uh, previous BCGS and GSC till work was a little dated in terms of its associated analytical suites. So we did recover over 1,400 samples, samples from uh, storage in Victoria and Ottawa um, in cooperation with the BCGS as well as Elaine Plouffe for the GSC. And uh, these were also analyzed for the same uh, analytical uh, methods uh, we did with our actual till, till sampling. Uh, there's a list on the bottom is, uh, um, you can see Vic Levson, Ray Letts even in there, Travis Farabee, Plouffe and Williams. We're all involved in some of the earlier work uh, in, the, in the area. Okay, we also did analytical quality control. I think I've got one more slide of that. Um, it's, it's also an important consideration, this sort of, uh, uh, Technique is, was derived from uh, the Geological Survey of Canada's National Geochemical Reconnaissance Program. So it's, it's been del developed for many, many years. And, and we routine, re routinely use this uh, uh, with all our surveys. So, of course, we use field duplicates, analytical duplicates, and, and control reference standards. We also inserted blanks uh, into the uh, sample sequence to ensure that uh, there's so much work being done to the samples through the processing that uh, we wanted to make sure that we weren't getting any cross-contamination in that. Um, this data is actually gonna be available in the not too distant future if I actually complete that project for Krista. And so finally, this is my last slide. Uh, there really is a, a pretty expansive uh, exploration database now. We have uh, over 6,000 uh, samples that have been collected and analyzed for uh, uh, a, a wide range of, of elements. Uh, um, we also have published uh, 10 of these basal till potential maps on the, probably one of the second most important slide, apart from that beautiful picture of the basal till, is, is that, that compilation of uh, published and unpublished uh, basal till potential maps. Um, incredibly important and, and useful tool. Uh, which we're actually very proud of. Uh, probably one of the biggest disappointments of the whole survey is, is that we had planned to probably publish all 28, and uh, for some reason, one of our partners decided to bail out on us, so in the end, we only got 10 published. There are actually six in press, but if we would have actually maintained the program as we had planned, we probably would have had all 28 of those done as well. And I'm going to pass that on to Dave, who is really going to uh, provide some insight into the use of the data set. Thank you.
Do we have a pointer? Well, I was also going to say something for, about him, too. Go ahead. I, he, uh, he actually, we did the archive sample, and he actually took that material and had actually created uh, some analytical information related to the play concept. He's going to be talking about that. Uh, same presentation. Thank you. Thank you. That is exactly where we need to be. Okay. Nope, that's not even close to it. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to move through this pretty quickly. Um, we had a lot to cram in and we had some technical difficulties, so it's going to be difficult to get through all of this. But basically, up to this point, uh, Wayne's talked about generating this high quality data set. I'm going to talk about uh, what we did, the evaluation we did to actually define targets within this data set, and some of the uh, standard procedures and some of the more experimental things we tried um, working through it. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to throw this whole thing under the bus. Why doesn't surface sediment exploration work? Well, it's common that you'll get a surface sediment database, and there's no real patterns that emerge from it. You plot this stuff up, and everything looks random. And I can tell you the majority of the time, or well, maybe that's an overstatement. I can tell you that a, a portion of this is due to internal variability in the data set. And uh, what I mean by that is essentially there are characteristics within the data set that are causing contrast or causing differences in the analytical results when your geochemical values that are not related to mineralization. And these differences are making it difficult to identify um, you know, the contrasts that are related to mineralization that we're actually looking for. So these are things such as material genesis, sampling analytical protocols, a lot of things that we spent a lot of time uh, trying to weed out in the initial sample collection for this project um, that weren't necessarily in a lot of archive databases are still in there that you need to deal with. Um, so I'm going to use the term data standardization, and basically what this means is looking at that variability and seeing how uh, we can mitigate that. So uh, this slide, there's... Um, uh, there's really two parts to the method. There's the data standardization that I just spoke of, and then there's the data analysis part of it. Um, so with the data standardization, we want to find as much associated data as we can um, with the geochemical data set that's going to affect the geochemical data set, assess that effect on the data set, and if possible, mitigate that to, again, um, reduce that variability to just things associated with mineralization. And then the second part will be the data analysis. And for this, we looked at a multivariate and multimedia analysis. We wanted to tailor it to specific deposit types, see if we could identify something to look at, and then see if we could find that in the data set instead of the other way around. Um, so we'll start off talking about material genesis. And essentially what we mean here is material type. What processes uh, have gone on with this sediment before it got to where it is? So, a good contrast is we have a lake sediment core on the left here and the top left and on the top right we have, uh, again, the same beautiful basal till exposure that Wayne showed earlier. Um, and you can see in the lake sediment core, this stuff is gooey, there's organics in there, it's saturated, there's a lot of things that are going to affect the geochemistry going on in that environment, in that lake sediment environment. And then compared to the till next to it, this is material that was eroded, transported under the ice, deposited 12,000 years ago, and really is about the same as it was 12,000 years ago before we got in there with our picks and shovels and stuff. So it's pretty obvious these are going to have different geochemical signatures, and you know, it's not, this isn't rocket science, you guys can see that. But even within that, as, as Wayne mentioned earlier, um, till has a lot of different facies. There's actually nine different facies of till, and the reason this is important is because only the subglacial ones produce this, um, this dispersion model on the bottom here that we like to use to interpret that data. So if we're not looking at subglacial till, then we can't use this nice simple transport model to figure out where our material came from. So with the Trek data set, as uh, we had the archive data set that we reanalyzed, which is great, but some of these regional surveys, these reconnaissance surveys, they weren't using, they weren't really scrutinizing till facies, and in some cases material type, because what they were looking for was uh, essentially something, a, a representation. Is this an area that we want to look in? So when we went in to, to analyze this data, we wanted to identify, we wanted to filter out those more reconnaissance samples and really hone in on the till samples. So we started off with the, what we had for surficial um, geology information, which is uh, the basal till potential maps that we produce and the surficial geology 
um, information within those maps, as well as the regional maps that weren't available. And that was sort of a first pass. On the right side, uh, it's a little bit washed out, but the red samples are basically samples that the mapping suggests are not basal till. And as you move into the darker greens, these are samples that probably are basal till. So now we have sort of a general idea of what this material is. So the next step is to go look at the sample descriptions, because a lot of these were government surveys that had great sample descriptions. In some cases, they just told us what they sampled. Uh, and in other cases, uh, we, we sort of interpreted their sediment descriptions to sort that out. And then lastly, as we were in the field, we spent a lot of time in the field, dug a lot of holes as we were passing by these archive samples. And uh, we knew that some of these were in question. We would uh, just poke around in there and see what the environment was. I'm pretty sure my eyes were closed when you took that. <laughs> Um, so in the end, we did all of this, in, we did all of this analysis and uh, it turned about 25% of the historic uh, data was probably not basal till or we weren't confident, uh, or in fact, we were confident it wasn't. When we were on the fence, a lot of the time we would, um, we would you know, err on the side of caution because it is, it, you know, these guys knew what they were doing. So unless they explicitly said this wasn't till, we kind of tried to side with them as much as possible. Um, so the next thing we're going to talk about with data standardization is data distributions and statistical suitability. And really what this all boils down to is are the numbers suitable for analysis? And boil it down even further, and we're talking about the normality of the data distributions. A lot of the analysis we do do require some sort of normality. They look at measures of central tendencies, they look at percentile breaks, they look at things that describe data sets, but they only accurately describe the data set if the distribution is normally distributed. Um, so most geochemical data is log normally distributed to start with. So initially, you basically have to log everything. That's, that's kind of a no-brainer. Um, one of the issues we ran into with the, the historical data set was missing values. There's about 222 samples, archive samples, that didn't have enough material left over to reanalyze. So we substituted that with the original data, and uh, which also caused variation because those methods were different than the new ones, but we'll take care of that on the next slide. Um, and the last thing I'll talk briefly about is censored data distributions. And what this is referring to is that when you're below detection limit, you can't actually measure below detection limit. So at some point, you can see the graph on the top right here. The blue symbols are the original data. You've got the curve coming down, and then it just flatlines. This is really going to mess with our data distribution and our descriptions of our data set. So the way we uh, resolved this issue was basically if more than 1% of the data was censored, we looked at a uh, regression line or predicted values based on the regression line and we substituted those in there. Um, so that results in the green curve or the green symbols you can see there. It's a much more, much more normally distributed data set. And because these values are all below detection limit, we're not introducing um, anomalies that aren't going to be there. Uh, the table at the bottom is really just showing that for each element you need to look at these characteristics and determine it's probably going to be different for each element what you have to go through to get that data where you want it. Um, so I'm talking very fast on purpose, I apologize. Uh, so as far as the analytical protocols, we know there's differences and we talked about uh, the archive data versus the new data. So the archive data uh, using ICPES and the new data using ICPMS. Uh, the, the archive data is red, the new data is blue. And in the left columns here, you can see there's a histogram and a box plot. Both of these are showing that the archive data all plots on the high end of this. Now, before we do anything about that, we need to see if this is real. So we go back to the data set, we look at the distribution. Are the, all these samples near a silver deposit? Um, and if so, we don't want to do anything because these are real anomalies. But they weren't. They were scattered throughout the area. So uh, we were pretty confident that this had to do with the analytical methods. And we were able to level this data set. And you can see on the right, the leveled data is a little bit more, um, is a little bit more congruent with each other. Uh, for this, we use a Z-score leveling method. There's all sorts of different leveling methods. You can do just standard shifts, multipliers, and you really have to look at your data set to see which one, if any, are applicable to leveling. Um, you could introduce a lot of error by leveling a data set that isn't appropriate. Um, so there's a few quick plots. Again, a probability plots, uh, a normal curve and a probability plot, or a normal distribution is a straight line. So original data on top, uh, everything is very skewed to the right side. Uh, there's lots of sensors on the bottom or sensor data on the bottom. And then once we standardize this, we have much more normal distributions and uh, much more suitable for analysis. So the last thing I'm going to talk about uh, with data standardization is regional variation. Um, 
so one of the biggest influences on regional variation in a data set, especially with an area as large as the Trek area, is differences in bedrock lithology. And the lithologies that are going to be, that are out there, are going to influence the composition of the samples. So we're going to have variation in the data set that's related to bedrock lithology, which is not what we're after. Again, we're looking for variation due to mineralization. So we wanted, to face, we wanted to look and see what is the influence of bedrock on these till samples, and uh, can we mitigate it? Can we do anything about that? And the issue with doing this with till is till is transported by ice. So we know that the bedrock unit that's directly below the till is not necessarily the, the, what is contributed to the composition of that, of that sample. So we had, to, we had to do some sort of transport modeling or, or look at where these could have come from to determine what the bedrock source would have been. And uh, so this is kind of a two-step process. We started with a standard area of influence. An area of influence is basically the probable source region or potential source region for this um, till sample. So it has two factors. It has the length and it has the width. The length is associated with how far this material has traveled. And we don't have absolute control on this, so we looked at um, known dispersals or dispersal distances from known deposits, and we came up with a value, an average value of about two and a half kilometers to a percentile we felt was um, contributing to the composition of the material. And for the width of it, we looked at, this is basically transport vectors. So, and essentially when it boils down to it with till, how many different ice flow directions have affected this? So you take the sample, you do a buffer around it, you take your maximum minimum ice flow values, and that gives you your slice of pie. The more variation in ice flow, the bigger your slice of pie is gonna be. So these are our standard samples. The next thing we wanted to do is tweak the distances a little bit. Um, again, we don't have absolute values for this, but what we do have are relative values. We know that there are, there is information uh, that we can attribute to this and get some relative indications of sediment transport. Uh, so with surficial geology, thicker till units are typically farther traveled than thinner till units. So we take our standard AOI, we overlay, and if it's in a thicker unit, we scale it out a little bit. Um, the other two factors, directional slope, which is the slope in the direction of ice flow and rugosity, they have to do with um, ice velocity. The faster the ice is moving, the farther the sediment is typically transported. So again, we did the same thing. We put our standard AOIs over top of that, and then we scaled the factors accordingly. So what we end up on the right here, you can see we have all these uniquely shaped areas of influence for each till sample. And then we can extract the dominant bedrock source from within those areas of influence and start creating subpopulations that we can look at and assess the differences. Um, so what we're looking at here on the right side, which I probably should have labeled on the top graph, is the original data, and on the bottom graph is the leveled data. And um, you can see that the original data, we're looking at silver again. Uh, the original data, I think the reason it's always silver is because that's the first one alphabetically on the list. So that was always my go-to. Um, so you can see that there's quite a bit of variation in there. So we leveled this again using the Z-score method because we did have a normal distribution. Most of the data, or all of the data in fact, are close enough to normal. We were confident in the, in the procedure. And so after leveling it, things became a little bit more normal. Now I'm sure you, a lot of you are, you know, kind of clenching your fist right now. There are a lot of limitations to this. Uh, this was an experiment. This is something we wanted to try, see if it would work, and we did see some positive results. But one of the limitations is we are reliant on the accuracy of the bedrock mapping. In areas that are covered by thick drift, uh, it's very difficult to do accurate bedrock mapping. And like we heard earlier, um, you know, not everybody has taken advantage of all the opportunities out there to improve those, uh, that mapping. Unfortunately, when we did this, Joel hadn't finished his work yet, so we were using the BCGS database. And it required us to simplify the units because mappers, um, they, they describe things differently, they create different units, and we needed to combine some of these together. And we needed to really combine them based on their geochemical values. And uh, to be quite honest, that was well beyond the scope of our project. So we did the best we could to create a base layer for geology to use for this, but I think there could be some improvements in that. And the other thing, again, those transport distances, that modeling, we've, um, you know, we, this is all relative. So additional transport studies to provide some more quantitative numbers, some, some, some hard numbers on there, uh, would probably improve that. So we also did lake sediment transport modeling, and really this is a fancy way to say we delineated catchments for the area. And the purpose of this was really to see where the potential, um, what potential area is that lake sediment material coming from, or where do we want to follow up investigations if we do have lake sediment anomalies. And um, so basically we delineate these catchments and then we attribute the, the lake sediment data to 
uh, the catchments and symbolize it that way. Again, there are a few limitations to this, one of, it, one of which is we did collect multiple samples. If there was different basins in a lake, we'd collect multiple samples. <laughs> That's going to be tough. Um, so uh, <laughs> if all the samples are the same, this isn't a problem. They're all very similar. But if we do have one sample, there's a small picture. And you can see that there's one sample that's quite a bit more anomalous than the other ones. In those cases, we manually delineate a smaller, a smaller catchment that is based on the tributaries and the, the topography of that area. And the other problem, again, is the catchment size. And this is something that's also an issue with stream sediment um, analysis when looking at catchments. Uh, you get dilution effects. And is a lake sample in a catchment the size of a 1 to 50,000 map sheet really indicative of anything? It certainly doesn't help us hone in um, on, any, on any potential targets. Um, so for these, we simply just looked at the area. So on the right map there, the red are the really large ones, greater than 50,000 hectares. This is gigantic. This is not very useful for us. As we move into the greens, we get to the smaller ones. So we simply didn't attribute with these larger catchments. We just used point symbols to, to, to visually analyze those. Okay. Data analysis. Again, the concept was multivariate analysis. We wanted to tailor this to a specific deposit model or deposit type. So what we had to do was look at, first we needed a geochemical signature of these deposit types. And we got this by doing principal component analyses on geochemistry from certain deposits. And uh, I'll try and elaborate a little bit on that in a second here. Um, and the second part, so once we add those geochemical signatures, uh, what we need to do is find sediment that has that si signature, analyze the sediment to see if we can recognize that signature. And this was done doing a weighted sums analysis using that import or using that geochemical signature determined from um, determined from the principal component analysis. So we started out with a whole series of mineral deposits, um, basically anything that was common to the area. And uh, for the data, we looked at um, ARIS, went to the ARIS reports, and we found drill core data that had the elements we were interested in, a good suite of elements, also with reasonable detection limits that would be, um, that would be effective for us to work with. And uh, so we have a whole, different a whole bunch of different deposits here. Uh, the last one is the Fenton type deposit. Uh, this has a different name. There's Peter Holbeck's going to give a talk on this a little bit later. Ray uh, became a little bit enamored with this in a talk he uh, attended earlier. And he said, this is a really great thing. We should look at it. And I said, yeah, let's do it. We threw it in there. And um, there we go. Uh, don't worry, you're not supposed to be able to read this. Uh, <laughs> those in the back, I don't know, could you see these numbers? So really what we're looking at here, this is the results of our principal component analysis. Um, each one of these rows is the component associated with mineralization. Um, the yellow lines here separate the different deposit types. The green boxes are positive associations, red boxes are negative associations. And this is kind of the worst case scenario. Uh, there weren't really any consistent results. And, uh, you know, we were hoping to see some patterns, but it was quite random. There were some patterns that were emerging, but this did turn out to be quite random. And a bit unfortunate considering all the digging we had done to find data that we were going to use. Um, now, when we thought about this afterwards, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, a lot of these holes were exploration holes, so you're going to be um, crossing through different types of mineralization. You know, the, the focus mineralization is one thing, but there could be some associated mineralization on the outside that's going to confuse the signal. Um, and also, just these are sometimes classified on very little information. So there's the potential for misclassification of deposits. Um, so we went back to the data, and we looked at some, um, we looked at the data sets to find some more definitive things. So we scaled this back to just three types of deposits. Fenton style made the cut. Uh, we also got epithermal and porphyry. Um, when we did this, we were more selective about the input data. We did start to get uh, results that made a little bit more sense and were a little bit more consistent we were confident moving forward with. Uh, so we took our element loadings from the principal component analysis. Uh, we converted those relative important signatures, and that's what we're looking at in the bottom graph or the bottom table here. Uh, it's essentially the relative important signatures for each of those deposits uh, through about 18 elements. Um, and then, so we take these relative important signatures and we pump it into the weighted sums analysis on each sample, which basically gives us a single number that tells us how close it is to that geochemical signal. Um, Get close here. I think we got three or four slides to go. Uh, so here are some of the results we're looking at. So we've got the epithermal index on the left, porphyry in the center, fenton type on the right, um, and uh, the polygons are the catchment basins that were of a scale we decided to use, attributed with the uh, lake sediment data. There are some triangles on there which you probably can't see that are lake sediment sample sites, and then this, the circles that maybe you can see 
are uh, the till sites. And we can see we got some differences in here. We had different deposit models or relative importance signatures, so we would expect to see some difference. The epithermal are really concentrated near the top. Um, the porphyry and the Fenton style are a little bit more, um, a little bit more similar, but there are, is some variation within those data sets. So now we have some results to look, work with. We have some data to work with. The next, uh, what there, the next step was to delineate some actual targets. And what we're looking for here is clusters of samples that have similar dispersion, or that have a dispersion to them, and that are uh, similar in their, um, in their anomalousness. Um, or correlated. So we've got a few examples here. One of the things we're really looking for, because we use both the lake sediment and the till data set, we could strengthen our, our reduce the risk in the targets and strengthen our, our confidence that they are actual targets if we saw it in both data sets. So we've got some examples. Um, in the bottom right, the epithermal. Uh, you're not going to be able to see this very well, but there's a pink uh, catchment there, and then there's an associated till dispersal. And uh, in the center one, we've got porphyry. So all three of these have um, have uh, um, anomalies in both the data sets. Uh, with the epithermal, there is a mineral showing close to there, and it happens to be epithermal, which is great for us. Um, and in the center one, there's no mineral uh, associate, there's no mineral showing associated with that, and these are all very strong anomalies. This is an excellent target to go after. Uh, we've got really strong lake sediment samples, and there's three really strong till samples um, in, in down ice from those. So excellent uh, sample to go after. So in the end, we identified 88 different clusters or dispersals of samples, and we gave these things some characteristics uh, based on just descriptions, you know, what geochemical signature it had, if it was a specific one, or maybe it was all of them. And probably one of the more important things is whether there was actually um, a mineral occurrence associated with it, and whether we expected or whether we thought that there could be a source that wasn't yet identified. And uh, well over 50%, probably around 75% of these uh, did not have known sources. So there are, I mean, what this tells us is this area is still underexplored. There's still a lot of potential in this area. We have, last slide, we have, uh, yeah, and just trying to do the plug here for the project area. So there's a lot of potential in this area. There's a lot of things that are worthy of looking up on, uh, uh, sorry, following up on. And uh, there's a lot that we can do uh, to, to facilitate that. And again, these regional surveys are excellent for anybody. This data is out there. Please use it. Um, I'm not going to go through this whole slide because Ray's going to get the hook out in a second here. Um, a lot of this, or not a lot of this, a section of this was experimental. Um, some of the work we did, we just wanted to try some new things. So there are future studies that can be done to sort of improve the transport modeling. I think our relative important signatures are probably overcomplicated. You know, we can hone that down a bit and probably get a little bit more discrete results from that. So there's more we can do, but in the end, this was a great opportunity to really get in on the ground floor of a surface exploration project and take it right through to the end and, uh, you know, along the way, making all the right steps, collecting the right information, the right context that we need to do uh, those things. Ray's kicking me off. So thank you very much.